desenvolvimento e sustentabilidade. Que desafios para as organizações? Chama-se Shai Efrati, vem de Israel, é um médico, professor associado da Faculdade de Medicina Sackler e da Escola de Neurociência Sagol da Universidade de Tel Aviv e é também diretor do Centro Sagol de Medicina e Pesquisa Hiperbárica em Israel. Tem focado a sua investigação em novos aspectos da medicina hiperbárica e da reabilitação cerebral. Shai Efrati, Professor Shai Efrati, welcome to Connecting Health. Good morning. Are you listening to us? Hi, welcome. It's an honor to have you with us. Honor to be here. Happy to be here. I'm, I'm working on my Spanish. It's not so good, so we will have to speak uh, English during the lecture, if that's okay with you. Thank you. We are all very curious about your ideas uh, about uh, reverse aging, so the next minutes are all yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to be with you. Unfortunately, we cannot, we cannot meet face to face, so we will have to do it online. Uh, it's a little bit difficult, as you know, because I cannot see your face and I cannot get feedbacks from you. But let's, let's start to do it. Let's see, let's see where, we can, where we can go from here. When we are speaking about aging, There is a major question to physicians like me. And the major question for me before going into it is, is aging a disease? This is a crucial question because if we are referring to aging as something that happened as part of the nature, something that we take for granted, and this is the normal, then, then Physicians like me should not deal with it. We should deal with diseases, other diseases that we need to cure. But if we refer to aging as a disease, it means that people like me should get into it and not only slow it down. We should tackle it just like we are tackling any other disease, meaning we should reverse it. We should take the biology back in time. And the answer to the question whether aging is a disease, yes or not, the answer for me is quite, is quite simple because if a long life, my functionality, cognitive functionality, physical functionality, sexual functionality is declining and that affect my quality of life, so for me it's a disease. And once I define it as a disease, 
that I need, I need to tackle it, I need to treat it, I need to refer to it just like any other disease that we have. And with regard to aging, if we are referring to aging a disease, there is a frame that we should all be familiar with. And the frame, the, it's frailty. That's, that's the phrase. And frailty, it's not an inevitable cause of aging. Frailty means that our system is depleted, means that the system is very fragile. And if we have any challenge, any obstacle that the biology need to challenge, like even a small virus like Corona, then the biology will not be able to overcome it and it will crush. And if we are speaking about aging, this is the thing that we want to target. It's not that we are aiming for longevity. This is not the problem. We are aiming to the functionality. We are aiming to frailty. And as you can see in the graph on the right side of the screen, you can see that you can have normal aging without frailty. Frailty is reaching only for a very small period of the end. But look at the other alternative in the blue line. You can see that this guy is going into frailty relatively early. And all this period of time during the frail period is not, it's not a good time. It's not something that any one of us wants to be in. If we are looking at the scientific publication of frailty, you can see that it's a relatively new thing that investigator, physician, biology like me started to investigate. And you can see that it's skyrocketing, meaning every year that passed, we have more and more studies, we have more and more intervention that I aim in to understand better what frailty is and how we can reverse frailty. And should be clear that frailty is a medical condition. This is not an inevitable result of aging. Again, if we want to target something, we need to be able to measure it. Just like blood pressure, we cannot treat blood pressure unless we can measure blood pressure. Once we can measure blood pressure, we can use different intervention. We can use different medication. We can use lifestyle modification and things like that. But first we need to measure. So how can we measure aging? There is what we call chronological aging. Chronological aging, it's the time that elapsed from the day that we were born until where we are now. This is not relevant. Why it's not relevant? Because this is something we cannot change. So instead of saying, or instead of referring to chronological aging, we have a new definition. We call it biological aging. And what is biological aging? Biological aging is the sum of two. It's the sum of physiological aging, the way the different organ in our body are functioning, and the sum of the genomic aging. And we will get to that in the future, in the, in the upcoming uh, phase of, the, of this lecture. And this is the sum of two, okay? So when we are saying biological aging, we are referring to the sum of genomic aging together with the physiological aging. Looking at aging and understanding better what aging means, you can look at these two pictures. On the left side, you can see these kids, and I'm sure that if I will take these kids and put it in the room where you are now, Five minutes, all the chairs will be up, the tables will be down, it will be a full disaster in the room. On the other hand, if I'm taking these people on the right side and put it in the same room, I can come the day after and everything will be in place. And that means that aging is actually an energy depleted condition. Here we have a burst of energy when we are young, we are tearing everything apart and on the left side, it's the energy, our ability to generate energy is declining. And the part in our body that is responsible for the energy generation at the cellular level is the mitochondria. Along age, the mitochondrial function is declining, declining significantly. And there are many reasons for that. 
one of the crucial reasons that is responsible for the decline in the mitochondrial function is the reduction of the blood perfusion to the organ. Along aging, we have occlusion of the blood, blood vessels. It happens all over the body. We call this process atherosclerosis. If it's happening in the brain, we will call it in large blood vessels, we will call it stroke. If it's tiny blood vessels in the brain, we will call it cognitive decline. If it's happening in the heart, in a large blood vessel in the heart, we will call it myocardial infarction. And if it's small blood vessels, we call it heart failure, et cetera, et cetera. But this, this is the process. This is what happening. And what we actually want to do is rejuvenation. We want to regenerate a damaged tissue, a damaged brain, a damaged heart. We want to rejuve rejuvenate the damages that happen to us along life. So this, this is what we need to do in order to do what we call reverse aging. For any regeneration pro pro process that we have in our body, we have four crucial elements that we want to achieve, that we need. We need a trigger because nothing happened without a trigger. We need omnipotent stem cells, cells that can differentiate into the damaged tissue. We need a supporting environment. And since we spoke about the occlusion of the small blood vessels, we need a generation of new blood vessels. And we will go one by one and we can understand how we can achieve each one of the four. Let's start with the trigger. The most powerful trigger that we have in our body to induce any regenerative process is hypoxia, is lack of oxygen. Once we have hypoxia, it means that there is a damage and then the body starts to activate all the regenerative process that should target this damaged organ. And one of the crucial factor that is responsible for that is HIF. HIF stands for hypoxic induced factor. This is a transcriptor factor that once it's up, a lot of genes will be start to be expressed and these genes are responsible for the regenerative process. By the way, there is two Nobel Prize over it something like 10 months ago, it's over the HIF. So we need HIF. So if we want to induce HIF, so we're thinking what, what you need to do, you can take a person, hold his breath, stop his heartbeat, he will have hypoxia, and then we will have an increase in HIF. There is only one problem, it's not, it's not healthy. So we were thinking what the body actually sense. Does the body sense absolute values or does the body sense fluctuation, the delta? It happens to be that there is nothing absolute in nature. Everything is relative. And what the body sense is the delta. So if the body sense the delta and hypoxia, lack of oxygen is not healthy, what we are doing, we are taking a person into this chamber compressing the chamber, this is our center in Israel, increasing the pressure with high percentage of oxygen. And by that, we can increase the amount of oxygen to very high level. When the patients are in the chamber, they are wearing a mask, and then we can only ask them to take the mask off. Once they are taking the mask off, there is a sharp decline from very high level of oxygen back to the normal value. This decline, this delta is being sensed by the body as hypoxia. Even though there is no hypoxia, there is hyperoxia. But the body sends the delta and activate the things that happen during hypoxia in hyperoxy condition. We call it the hyperoxic hypoxic paradox. And once we are doing that, and this is an example from patients that are coming to a certain protocol in the hyperbaric regeneration of fluctuation. You can see the increase in the amount of HIF, the hypoxic induced factor along this treatment and back to the normal once we are finishing. So we can have the trigger. This is the first thing. Once we have the trigger, this trigger also triggers stem cells. 
you are all familiar with stem cells, but in order to simplify the stem cells, you know, whoever created us knew that there would be a problem along life. And this, this machine was not generated for a day or two. So in order to overcome the damage, whoever created us, instead of giving us repairs, he gave us a three dimensional printer. These are the stem cells. Stem cells are cells that can differentiate into the different organs. And once we are doing this fluctuation, inducing the HIF and generating the hyperoxic hypoxic paradox, you can see that along this protocol of treatment, we have a significant increase in the amount of the stem cells. And this is something we are measuring in the peripheral blood. So this is hematopoietic stem cells, and it's clearly seen in the circulation. But what we can also see is mesenchymal stem cells. Mesenchymal stem cells are cells that are located in the tissue, but once we are given this protocol, we can see that their amount is so dramatically increased that we can also see it in the circulation going to different location in the body. So we have the trigger, we have the stem cells, but it's not enough. We need a supporting environment. If I will take this plant and put it here on the left in the desert, even though it will be the best plant in the world, what will happen in the desert? Probably, probably nothing. Because this is environment does not support the growth of this plant. On the other hand, if I will take this plant and put it here on the right side, it will flourish and grow. It means that the supporting environment is crucial. We are playing a lot with stem cells in our lab. We are very good in mice and rats. In mice and rats, we can cure almost anything. But in human beings, we are not so good with injection of stem cells. And one of the reasons it's what you see over here. This is a normal perfused tissue. But what happened in humans, like we spoke before, is occlusion of small blood vessels. And once this is happening, we have a desert over here after the occlusion. And it doesn't matter what plant I will take, what stem cells I will take. If I put it here in that desert, it will not grow because it doesn't have the crucial elements like oxygen needed for its proliferation, for its flourish. Once we are taking this occlusion and going into hyperbaric oxygen chamber, we are increasing the amount of oxygen that can go into the malperfused tissue by diffusion. And now when I will take the same plant, the same stem cells and put it here, now it can flourish. And once I have that, I have the trigger, I have the stem cells, I have the energy, then also an amazing thing can happen like angiogenesis, generation of new blood vessels. By doing that, we are changing the basics. Can we induce that? Yes, of course, because otherwise I would have told you another story. And this is an example from a brain, a mice brain, okay? Unfortunately, in humans, we are not taking the brain out and we can see over here quite clearly how we can generate the angiogenesis with the repeated hyperbaric oxygen treatment, with the hyperoxic hypoxic paradox. In human beings, we cannot take the tissue out, but we can see it by perfusion MRI. This is perfusion MRI. The upper row is before treatment. The more yellow and red, the more perfusion. The upper row is before. This is cerebral blood flow before after treatment and the bottom row is the delta. Meaning we can see and induce angiogenesis even in humans. Going back to, to aging, aging in the brain. One of the biggest threat to the Western society is not Corona. Corona will be here in a year or so, it will be gone. But the Alzheimer, dementia, and the age-related cognitive decline, this is the number one threat to our Western community. And when we are looking at the brain of an Alzheimer, mite, mice, rat, or human beings, what we see, we see amyloid plaque. And the amyloid plaque are actually surrounding 
the occluded blood vessel, the ischemic tissue. Today we, are, we understand that the amyloid plaque are not the cause of the disease, but rather as a result of an inflammatory process that happen in a relatively hypoxic environment. How do we know that? We know that because after investigating it for many years and reaching clinical trials and taking the amyloid plaque out, we see that there is no significant change in the physiological function in the brain. So today we understand that amyloid is a marker. It's not a disease. It's a marker of inflammation that happen in the brain. If we are working in animal models, it enables us also to evaluate things directly. We can evaluate the blood flow in a certain location. And this is a model of Alzheimer that we see. And we see that along the disease, there is a sharp decline in the blood flow in the brain in the Alzheimer mice. And if we are taking them to hyperbaric oxygen repeated treatment, the hyperoxic hypoxic paradox, we can see angiogenesis and improve in the blood flow in the brain. By doing that, the amyloid plaque will disappear. The upper row is before treatment with hyperbaric oxygen. The down row is with treatment. And you can see how the amyloid plaque disappears. It's not because we use antigen to the amyloid plaque. It's not because of that. We are targeting the basic pathology that is responsible for the development of the cognitive or the Alzheimer disease, as you can see over here. So this is, this is how it is. Amazing thing that we can see also by using the certain protocol of the hyperbaric oxygen therapy is neurogenesis, not only angiogenesis. Neurogenesis means that we can see generation of new neurons in the brain. I was taught in medical school that things like that cannot happen, but surprise, surprise, here it is. You can see quite clearly how the neurons can be generated. In humans, we are not taking the tissue out, but by using MRI DTIs, we can actually look at the fibers in the brain. And as you can see over here, here up, you can see before treatment and after treatment. That's how I like to demonstrate things. Quite clearly, before, after, neurogenesis, and that's it. When we have started to work, we have started with model of stroke, of traumatic brain injury, and we have first learned from this model how we can work and where the hyperbaric can be effective. The classical is stroke. In stroke, we have an area which is fully necrotic, as you can see over here, the necrotic area doesn't change. It's an empty area that is filled with fluids. The candidate for the treatment is the surrounding area, the part over here that we call it penumbra, hibernating, stun brain. It happens to be that this metabolic dysfunction area can preserve for years after the acute insult. And in order to demonstrate where hyperbaric can work, you can see this this example. This is a case of post-stroke patient. This is a combination of metabolic imaging of the brain, SPECT scan with anatomical imaging of the brain. The blue area is a fully necrotic tissue. The necrosis doesn't change. The necrosis stays the same. The green is metabolic dysfunction area, and this is the area that is improving. And whatever function related to it, that will be the function that will improve. It's not that hyperbaric treat hands that it not, it's not moving or leg that is not moving. It triggers a tissue, a wound. And whatever related to that wound, that's what will happen. And if we don't see that area, we will not have any effect. The same holds for traumatic brain injury. And the goal of our lecture is to speak about aging. Something like, 10 months ago, we have finished probably the most comprehensive study, clinical study ever done on normal aging population. What we have done in this study, we have two people who are 65 years old, fully healthy, fully potent, no significant disease, no obese, non-smoker, us, 
okay? And what we have done to them, we have done to them a full week of evaluation where we evaluated everything. Brain, MRI, cognitive function, heart, cardiac MRI, uh, maximal exercise tests, skin, uh, whatever you name it. It's a full week of, of evaluation. And then we randomize them into two groups. Treatment, hyperbaric oxygen treatment, and a control group. And after three months of treatment or control, the people were re-evaluated. Let's look at the cognitive function. In purple, you see the treated group. In blue, you see the control group. And you can see quite clearly that with the treatment, we see a significant improvement or increase in the cognitive function. We specialize emphasize on different memory domain, attention, and information processing speed. It's not that we are slowing the decline, we are actually reversing it, improving the cognitive function. And we can see it also in this cognitive test. And it's not the test, it's not the cognitive that was improved, it's the biology of the brain. For example, if we are looking at the hippocampus, which is the part that is responsible for our working memory, you can see in the DTI before treatment and after treatment, you can see a built up of nerve fibers in the hippocampus. Baseline are three months without treatment and then a treatment. And that's the reason why the cognitive were improving because we have changed the basic biology of aging. Same hold for the perfusion in this area. You can see baseline without treatment and then with treatment. And this process doesn't happen only in the brain. Of course, once we are increasing the stem cells and inducing the regeneration and angiogenesis, it happens also in other parts of the body. Here you can look at the cardiac MRI. You can see baseline without treatment and then a treatment. You can see that there is angiogenesis also in the heart. Same happened in the kidneys before and after, and same happened in other organs. For example, this is the, the penis, okay? This is the penile. Erection is blood flow. So we have perfusion MRI of the penis. You can see on the left before treatment, you can see the lack of perfusion, the occlusion of the small blood vessels. Here, Viagra doesn't help. And on the right side, you can see after treatment, you see the angiogenesis. And now after the treatment, there is no need for Viagra. So the process, as you can see in this individual, in the upper row, it's before treatment. On the left is the brain, cerebral blood flow before and after treatment. And maybe the big brain, which is the penile, you can see it before and after treatment. Once we have improvement in the perfusion, the cardiac function, we can see also improvement in the physical fitness. We can see 50% improvement in the anaerobic threshold, which is, which is huge. If I will take an elite sport and will try to improve his anaerobic threshold by 50%, it's, it's many years, if ever, of practice. So this is a very significant improvement. So we spoke about biological aging. So we were focusing on the physiological aging, how we are changing the brain functionality, cardiac functionality, sexual functionality, physical performance, et cetera, et cetera. What about, what about the genomic aging? When we are speaking about genomic aging, we are not referring to the DNA sequence. If you will look at this, for example, this is, this is my father, okay? You can see that from the left side of the screen until the right side of the screen, my father has the same DNA. But even though he had the same DNA, the biology performance was completely completely different, okay? So it's a, the same DNA, but what is different is what genes are being expressed. And this is what we call epigenetic. Even though we have the whole book, 
it depends what chapter we are currently reading. So this is, this is epigenetic, what genes are being expressed. Another phrase that you should, you should all be familiar with, it's a nascent cell. What is a nascent cell? Cells that we have growing, for example, in a cell culture can go either into proliferation, meaning replication, or to organize cell death, which is apoptosis. But if I'm taking cells in the lab, the cells will replicate something like 40 times, and then they will stack. They will not replicate them anymore and will not kill themselves anymore. And these are senescent cells. These are stuck cells. And these cells are the cells that are accumulating the DNA mutation. And these are the cells that at the end can be developed into cancer cells and to damage to the tissue and inflammation in the tissue. These are the cells that we want to take back. So why the cells suddenly stop the replication? When we are looking at the DNA leads, we can see we have two leads, but at the tip of the DNA, we have a bumper that's supposed to protect the DNA sequence from the damage that happened during the replication. And these bumpers are, are the telomere. They are here at the tip. They're supposed to protect the DNA that we have inside. And every time the cell is replicating, the telomere length is shrinking. And once we don't have telomere anymore, then the cell is stuck. And this cell become senescent cell, a stuck cell that can develop either into cancer or can cause to, uh, damage to the surrounding. And this is something that we need to reverse at the biological, cellular, epigenetic level. Can we do that? Probably yes, because otherwise I would focus on something else. And what you see over here, this is uh, the first results that we have from our reverse aging population. You can see in blue the control group, and in purple you see the treatment group. And what you can see over here for the first time in human beings, when we are using a specific hyperbaric oxygen protocol that utilizes the hyperoxic epoxic paradox, we can see an elongation of the telomere length. And this is something, something really, really big. Again, we will never claim for longevity because this is something that we cannot measure, but telomere length are prolonging. Once we have a prolongation of the telomere length and we have on average 25% telomere elongation, which is huge, we can see a significant decline in the amount of the senescent cell. And these are the cells that may develop into cancer cell. And this is the aging cell population that we have in our body. So to conclude, should we target, is aging a disease? In my perspective, it is a disease because it has a significant detrimental effect on my, at least, daily activity living and my quality of life. So I'm not taking, I'm saying that we should not take aging or the age-related functional decline for granted. In order to do that, in order to tackle it, we need to measure it. So we have a definition which is the biological aging. The biological aging is the sum of the physiological aging. And here we can measure everything, brain, heart, physical function, sexual function, all of this is this part. And we can also measure the genomic aging, which is the epigenetic expression. And once we can reverse that and reverse that, it means that we can take the biology back in time. And once we have this model of measuring, tackling, remeasuring, we can build a suit that should be suitable for any specific individual. And once you can measure it, you can treat it. So the answer is yes, we can reverse the expected physiological decline. And I will make a pause over here because I can't see your face and I can't get any feedback for you. So I'm available now for question if you have any. Thank you very much.